Well, we've been talking about Joshua, and uh, we got back onto the Joshua uh, train, I guess, if you will, last week. Uh, went back on our study, um, and so we were in Joshua chapter 8 last week, and we were talking about getting back on track, and I almost kind of felt like that with the year, right? Getting back, I, I thought that was kind of a good one. I was like, oh yeah, get back to where we need to be, um, or, uh, you know, regaining, I guess we should say, the momentum, uh, or regaining, you know, the momentum that we lost uh, is kind of how it felt for me because I was like, man, you get through the holidays and it feels like you just want to lay down and wait for spring, <laughs> all right? Uh, especially now, <clears throat> laying down under a blanket, you know, with pillows all around you or something like that. Now is the time of year too, if I'm sitting down and I'm relaxing on my sofa, I don't mind if one of the cats crawls up on top of me because... <laughs> It's a warm spot, right? It's just that kind of weather. Uh, no, but I joke about that. But well, that's what we talked about last week was after the battle of Ai, uh, after Israel had to do, do these things, how they got back. They went back, they battled Ai, and they had to get back to where they needed to be, right? It was do this God's way. Fight the battle God's way. Make sure it's God's plan. Make sure everything that happens is the way God wants it to happen. So we are still in Joshua chapter 8, so if you would, take your Bibles and open them up to Joshua chapter 8 this morning, and today I want to actually talk about getting back to the basics. So, and you say, well, wait, they did. They they, they did it God's way, and they, they got that victory they were supposed to have. But at the end of this chapter are like a group of six verses, all right, that are they almost seem, I'll be honest with you, kind of out of place for like what happened, but it, it's so significant. We cannot just skip past them and say, okay, Israel defeated AI and they went on and they did this because in these verses, you know, they, they took the time and they built an altar. But what's happening in these verses is so significant. We need to look at these. In Joshua chapter eight, we're going to begin in verse 30. We're going to read verse 30 and 31, and then we're going to look down through the end of the chapter. Um, and then I'm also going to ask you to do this. This is one of those days where I'm gonna, we're going to go to a different passage, and I want you to keep your finger so you're going to go back and forth. We're going to be doing a lot of back and forth in two different chapters. And this is why this is significant. This is pretty important. God is not a God of happenstance. God is intent on everything he does. And this is something that we need to, to look at because sometimes in our Christian life, We just need to get back to where we should have been in the first place, right? Get back to the basics that God wants us to do and just do them well. To be focused on what he told us to do in the first place. Here's the thing. We look at that and we say, okay, Christianity, man, you you know, there's so many different aspects of Christianity. I'll be honest with you. I think the Jews made it harder than it had to be, right? Uh, God gave them enough laws. I think in the Old Testament, there were like 600 laws. In Jesus' day, there were only... 1500. They just kept adding to it. They kept doing it. We don't need to make Christianity more difficult than it needs to be. We just need to focus on what God intends for us to focus on, to get back to the basics of where our walk with him should be and focus on that and serve him in that way. So I want us to look in Joshua chapter eight here in verse 30. It says, then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron. And they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. So after the battle of Ai, we see that Israel stops They go to a place that's called Mount Ebal. We're going to talk about that place. And there was another mountain right next to it. They were twin twin mountains, if you will, uh, two of them together. And they were very different mountains. But they stop, they build an uh, an altar, excuse me, and they offer these sacrifices. But I want you to look at what it says in the first part of verse 31. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel. That is an extremely significant statement in this passage. Because Israel in this, right here, in this moment, is finally getting back to the basics of where they needed to be. They went back to the beginning of what they were commanded to do to serve God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you. God, we truly do praise you. We truly glorify you this morning. God, we just ask now that our hearts and our minds would be open unto your word. That it would 
it would touch deeply where it needs to touch. God, bless where it needs to bless, challenge where it needs to challenge, and work where it needs to work. I pray we would hear from your word this morning. We pray and ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. So like I said, we see this and it says, hey, so Israel defeats Ai. They get the victory. Remember, they, they set up the ambush and they planted like 5,000 people on the other side. And then they went to the front doors and they acted like they were going to take the city. And Ai comes out to meet them and they ran. That was the whole plan was to, 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 to pull the army away from the city. And then when the army was away from the city, those other men that were in hiding came in. They decimated the city. They burnt the city to the ground. And it said it's left in desolation even to this day is what it said in the Bible. So AI was utterly and completely destroyed. And one of the things they were allowed to do in AI that they weren't allowed to do at Jericho was what? Take the spoil. They could take the cattle and the sheep and the chickens and whatever else they wanted to take, right? The food, the wealth, the gold, silver, whatever people had, they were allowed to take that out of the city. God gave them that city for spoil. What did they not do? Set the first fruits aside for God. That was part of the problem with Jericho. God said, no, this is mine, so don't take it. So now they win that victory, and now they're back on that mountaintop, right? They're excited. They're like, this is how it's supposed to be. Jericho is a victory. And then immediately after, they go to Ai, and then they got a problem. Because they didn't do it right. They didn't do it the way God wanted it to do. So they had to get back on track. They had to get back the way they were supposed to be doing it. So they got that momentum back. They defeat AI. And now you think, all right, let's roll on to the next city. Because you kind of want to keep it going, right? I mean, you know, it's been kind of hard watching the Chiefs for the last, you know, five, six weeks, seven weeks or whatever, right? It's like they started off really good at the beginning of the season. And then, well, you know, these games, they lost it. But if anybody watched the game last night, you're thinking, now this, this is what the Chiefs are supposed to do. Maybe if it's four degrees every time they play. All right. Uh, then, then, you know, then everybody can play. And I knew that it was funny because people were talking and they were like, they said, oh, the, the temperature is an unfair advantage for the chiefs. I said, I don't think the temperature is an advantage for anyone in this situation. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw Patrick Mahomes throw the ball to Travis Kelsey. He tried to catch it and every finger shattered and the ball went right through his hands. And he was picking his fingers up off the field. It was that cold uh, is what it felt like. I mean, it was just cold. I was like, there is zero advantage. But I just thought that was kind of funny. But it was after the game where we were watching that after the game and everybody was just really excited. And they're like, all right, we've got all this momentum and they're ready for the next game. I'm like, whoa, there's a lot of stuff to do before the next game. All right. First off, you got to fix a, a helmet. We watched the game. I was like, never seen that before. It's like, okay, it's really cold when helmets are shattering. Maybe you guys should go inside and warm up for a bit. All right. I just thought that was kind of funny. But, but I was just like, now they've got a whole week of work they got to do. They can't just say, well, let's, let's, we got this momentum. Let's just keep it rolling. No, there's things they need to focus on. Now they got to prepare for the next team, who they're going to play, everything else. Right. That's just how it is. It's no different right now going on with Israel. It's like they want to go, all right, we got the momentum. And Joshua says, nope, stop, time out. It's time for us to do what we should have done in the first place. And that's why this is important. And that's why we see that in verse 32, where it says, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel. What does that mean? I mean, they built this altar because Moses commanded. Moses isn't even around. So what did he do? Hey, when you get in there, I want you to take your fingers or turning your Bibles, I guess you're supposed to say, and then we're, like I said, you're going to use both of your fingers today. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, I want everybody to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 27. Deuteronomy chapter 27, we're going to be going back and forth. Because for us to get back to the basics, where we need to be so that we can do what God wants us to do, it's important for us to know and remember what God has instructed us to do. All right. So that's what we're talking about. So the first thing Israel had to do when it came to getting back to the basics was to return focus to spiritual things. They had to get their focus back on spiritual things. And we see, we see that one on the first verse that we read this morning. And I'll read that while you're going to Deuteronomy chapter 27, because we're going to read a couple verses here in Deuteronomy chapter 27. But it says, Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. So what they did was they stopped. They went to Ebal, which was this mountain. And Ebal actually means like rock. So what they did was they pulled probably rocks off of Mount Ebal because it was a very desolate looking mountain, very rocky mountain. And they pulled those rocks and they built the altar to the Lord. Now, remember what I said, I want you to go to Deuteronomy 
chapter 27. By the way, it said there, according to the book of the law, that's what Deuteronomy literally means, right? It means law. So if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 27, I'm going to turn my Bible there real quick. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 27 in verse 1, it says, and Moses with the elders of Israel, right? Mo Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people. So what we're talking about here is what they're doing in Joshua chapter 8 was commanded by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Moses was still alive, and he said, here's what you're going to do. Here's what you have to do. And so the first thing that they needed to do, and Moses was instructing them to do, is go back to the roots. Get back your focus on spiritual things. Because why did they lose to Ai? Their focus was off of the spiritual. Their focus was off of the spiritual. Do you realize that every battle a Christian faces is a spiritual battle? It doesn't matter if it's a physical issue or if it's a carnal issue. It is a spiritual battle. We always fight a spiritual battle. No matter what we go through in life, the battle that we face, the battle that we fight is a spiritual battle. Israel was facing Jericho when they first came into the land and giant walls. But do you realize their battle was a spiritual battle? Because God told them, I'm not going to have you do anything in this siege. You don't have to do anything until the walls fall. After the walls fell, they went in and they killed whatever people were alive. That was it. That was all they had to do. And then God says, now the only thing I want you to do here is bring out the gold, the silver, all the precious stones, all, and give it to my house. The first thing that you do is give me the first fruits, give me that offering. And then what happened? They got their eyes on the stuff. And then Achan brought that into his house instead of putting it where it belonged, was to God. And not only that, but now Israel said, hey, look at how strong we are. We destroyed Jericho. Now we can go into that. We only need to send like 3,000 people. It'll be fine, Joshua. Let's just send 3,000 people. We don't need to, to mount everybody up and send everybody down there. So then they go down there and they get defeated. Their eyes came off of the spiritual things. Deuteronomy chapter 27. I want us to look at verse 4 and verse 5 in here. It says, therefore, it shall be when ye be gone over Jordan, that ye shall set up these stones, which I command you this day in Mount Ebal. What? Moses was talking about Mount Ebal before ever Israel crossed the river. And thou shalt plaster them with plaster. And there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God. An altar of stones, thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Moses said, when you get into the promised land, when you get where you need to be, there's something you need to do. You need to stop everything that you're doing. You need to stop everything. And in Mount Ebal, you're to set up an altar to the Lord. Get back to where you need to, have, to be. Get back to the basics. He says, stop and realize this is about God. Everything that we have is about God. You realize we come to church because it gets us back to where our focus needs to be. Amen. It brings us back to where we need to be because we need to sit back and say, this is about God. And not just every Sunday is about God, but Sundays remind us that Monday yeah. is about God. Yeah. And Tuesday, it's about God. Yeah. Wednesday isn't just hump day at work. It's about God. Thursday and Friday, oh, everybody says, Friday's definitely about God because everybody says, thank God, it's Friday. <laughs> That's the only other day people focus on God, right? Every day we have is about God. And now, so Moses is trying to tell the children of Israel here is, when you get into the land, take the time to make it about God. Because if you lose your focus, bad things are going to happen. What happened? Before ever they got to Mount Ebal, things began to unravel. Why? Because they forgot about worshiping God and making it always about God. Every battle we fight is a spiritual battle. Therefore, the greatest defense that we have is God. Amen. And when we turn our focus to Him and we say, God, I'm going through this in my life right now. I need your strength. I need your love. I need your... We have to remind ourselves of that sometimes. Go back and read the Psalms of David. 
Read all of them. I love his attitude, you know, when he's, when he's writing these psalms because, man, he'll start and he'll be like, you know, where is God? And, you know, and, and I'm crying out. And God heeds my prayers. And then like halfway through, it's like everything begins to change in his heart. It's like he allowed God to begin to work on him. And he's like, but because God, you are my strength. You are my strong tower. You're my fortress. You're my shield. You're my buckler. Man, he, he compares God to what? His place of defense. And this is a man who fought real battles in a real world. And still, every time he talked about it, he says, oh yeah, I carried a shield. I carried a spear. I carried a sword. I've defeated multiple men. I've, I've killed men by the hundreds. I've killed men by the ones. The, my first victory in battle was against a giant that nobody else in Israel was willing to face. But still, even when he faced Goliath, what did he say? You, to come, you come to me with swords and spears. I come to you in the name of the Lord. He was like, you really think you stand a chance when I have God on my side? Folks, does this world really truly stand a chance against Christianity when God is on their side? I know there was a, there's an email that went out, and we've been praying for our church, our sister church in Mexico City, Mount Zion Baptist Church, because they're kind of going through it right now. You know what they're experiencing? Attacks from the world. There's people in the world that want to stop this church. But I got bad news for those people. That church has God on its side. Yes. And as, as, as much, you know, hatred and as, as much, you know, disdain that the world can throw at Mount Zion Baptist Church in Mexico City, it's still God's church. Right. And God is a whole lot bigger than any man, any woman, or any group of people in this world. Yes. So what do we do? I, Tim called me earlier this week, and, you know, and when he was telling me about it. And I said, what do you need? My question was this what do you need from us? I said, I said, just tell me what, we, what you need and we'll try to do our best to take care of it. He goes, we need prayer. He goes, that's all we're asking for right now. We need prayer. He goes, I'm going to hang up with you and I'm going to go on to the next person on my list. And I'm, cause he goes, I'm trying to spread the word. I said, well, I will help. I said, brother, you have our prayers. So you know what I tell you to do? Pray for Mount Zion Baptist church. Pray for that church every day. Because right now they're, they're feeling it. I mean, there's, there's a legitimate attack on that church because the world does not want a church that sees millions of people get saved to see, succeed. Satan does not want to see a church that baptizes thousands upon thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of people every year to continue doing what it's doing. That church has got the world pretty angry, but it's God's church. And what they can't afford to do is to lose their focus. They have to know, hey, this is about God. So God tells Israel, come back to what matters. So no matter what we face in life, where do we always go? Back to focus on God. Every day we wake up. Man, if you're going through it, every day you wake up. And it's so easy to we wake up in the world and we think, oh, great, you know, it's another day in the world. This is just fantastic. My job's terrible. My boss is terrible. You know, people don't like me. My family hates me. Blah, blah. You know, I'm dealing with this, dealing with that, all these negative things. But every day we need to wake up and say what? Today, God still sits on the throne. And today he's still my God. He is my Lord. Today, Jesus Christ is no less my Savior than he was yesterday or the day before. You realize that Jesus Christ is the same before our problems start? Even after our problems start? It's not like he changes. What changes? Our situation. That's it. But God does not. He is still God. And so Joshua takes Israel and he says, we're going back to what we were instructed to do from our leader Moses, when Moses was still alive. We're going to go back to that because this is important. So that's what we see there. The second thing that, they do, that we need to see is that we need to return to our commitment. Return to our commitment. We go back to that spiritual things, but then return to the commitment. Now in Joshua chapter 8, I want you to look at verse 31 and 32. All right, because we read verse 31, but look at verse 32 also. It says, as Moses, 31, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel... As it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron. And they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. Verse 32, and he wrote thereupon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. What did Joshua do? We're going to build the altar and we're going to write on the side of the altar. 
a copy of this law that Moses commanded us, which was a command from God, by the way, not from Moses. We know that. It was Moses that gave Israel the command. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 27, this is the end of Moses. This is like the end of his leadership. It's coming to an end. So he stands up. God was with him. God was working with him. Remember, the Bible also says that there arose up not another leader like Moses that walked with God and talked with God the way Moses did. Moses had a pretty good relationship with God. I'm sure Joshua was probably like, man, I wish I, wish I was a little bit more like Moses sometimes, right? Especially probably after Jericho. He was probably like, I really wish I was a lot more like Moses. I shouldn't have listened to those guys. Moses had problems too, right? Remember in the wilderness, Korah and his gang all rose up. Moses, you have too much authority. You need to give some of that out to somebody else. We'll take that from you. We'll, we'll, we'll take that authority and we'll do this. And what did Moses say? Not going to happen. And what, what did God do? Opened up the ground and swallowed them at whole so people could see. Like people watched it happen. What was the lesson? Don't go against the people that God puts in charge. That's what, cause They were literally usurping authority that didn't belong to them. Right? And so, you know, I look at Joshua and I'm thinking to himself, he's probably thinking, especially after AI, I really shouldn't have listened to those guys because I should have learned my lesson when I watched what happened to Korah because these guys said, oh no, well, let's do it this way and we'll go into AI and everything will be great. And it wasn't great. So Joshua says, we're getting back to where we need to be. Get back to the basics, right? First thing they did was they said, what? We're focusing on God building an altar. So we build this altar the way Moses instructed us to, and we're going to renew that commitment that we have to God, right? We're going to return to this commitment, renew this commitment, and focus on it because they were supposed to physically write things on this altar. We're going to talk about it because God gave them blessings and God gave them cursings. He said, you're going to be blessed if you do this. You're going to be cursed if you do this. So he was supposed to write those things on that altar. We see this back in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 1 and 2. It says, And Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you this day. This was not something new. It was not the Ten Commandments. It was not all. This is Moses saying, Listen to what I'm going to tell you right now. I want you to keep these things. I want you to do these things. Verse 2, And it shall be on the day when ye shall pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, that thou shalt set thee up great stones and plaster them with plaster. So he begins here in Deuteronomy 27, telling them exactly what they should have done. Israel had to learn a tough lesson, but you know what they did? They got back to the commitment they were supposed to make in the beginning. Because Moses challenged Israel, don't turn your eyes off of God. Stay focused on him and God will give you all the victories that you can handle. He'll give you, I mean, he promised you this land. That's what God said, right? I have given, remember a couple times when they were talking about the cities, God told Joshua, this is how I want you to fight Jericho because I've already given you the city. So in God, with God st stating that, it was already settled. There was nothing that was going to happen that Jericho could defeat Israel because God said, I have given you the city. Then they went and fought Ai. But there was no conversation with God before that battle, was there? Israel rushed off to fight a fight they shouldn't have been fighting because they didn't listen to God. They were defeated. Then Joshua, he's, on, he's tearing his, renting his clothes. He's asking God what's going on. I mean, he's literally begging God, God, what did we do wrong? God gets with him and said, this is what's going on. Now, Joshua, once you take care of this, once you get all the people's focus back, once you, don't worry about it. I've given you the city. Immediately in that moment, it was settled. Before ever a sword was raised, before ever the trap was set, victory was assured by God. Now I want you to go back before Israel crossed the river, Jordan. What did God say? I have given you the land. In God's eyes, it was what? It was settled. It was done. But God said, make sure your focus is on me. Make sure your commitment is with me. Return to that, Israel. That's what Joshua is saying. Return to this commitment here. The commitment was made when Moses was still alive. They lost it, and Joshua said, it's time to come back. We're stopping everything we're doing. We're going to Mount Ebal, and we're building an altar. And so they were returning to that commitment. The next thing we see in Joshua chapter 8, eight is that they, had re they rejoiced in God's provision. 
rejoice in what God has done for you. Take the time to tell God thank you. Take the time to glorify him. Look in verse 33. And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side of the ark and on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well as the stranger. That means the people that they picked up along the way that were with them. By the way, who was one of those strangers? Rahab. That's right. I heard somebody say it. Rahab and her family was part of that. All right. As well as a stranger. And he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. Second time we see that Moses had commanded them to do this thing. Now we see that half of the people are standing on the side of Mount Ebal, and half of the people are standing on the side of Mount Gerizim. Here's why this is significant. Again, remember this, God is not the God of happenstance. God is always intending what he, what he does. Mount Ebal was known as a, the rock. That's where they got the stones from. That's where they built the altar at. But God told them to separate. God told them to split up. And he says, I want half you over here and half you over here. Because this is what I'm going to do. All right. I'm going to tell you that if you do these things, I'll bless you. And I'm going to tell you if you don't do these things, that curses are going to come and trouble is going to come to you. That's basically what God is saying all right, in this moment. And God says, these things are going to bless you and these things are going to curse you. This is why this is so significant and why this is interesting. I told you Mount Ebal was a rock. Mount Gerizim, lush and green. Do you know the people that were standing on the side? And by the way, Israel was divided in half when they split up. And if you go and you look in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 27, they tell you which tribes are on which side. Moses literally told Israel, half over here, half over here. These tribes over here, these tribes over here. Then God's going to read the blessings on the green side and the cursings on the rocky side. And that's how it's going to be. But the people had to stop. And what did that do? That taught them to remember what God had taken them through. It taught them to recognize and rejoice in God's provision. I want you to go back to Deuteronomy 27. I want you to look at verse 6, verse 7. It says, and thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. We see that they did that. Okay? And then verse 7, and thou shalt offer peace offerings. They did that. And thou shalt eat there and rejoice before the Lord thy God. What were they supposed to do? Stop and rejoice in the Lord. When we give offerings to the Lord, and you know, I know our offerings are a lot different because y'all aren't bringing in like you know chickens and goats and sheep and cows. It'd be odd for somebody to bring unless it's like a Christmas play. Don't bring those things in, okay? And if you are going to bring one in for a Christmas play, check with Chris first, please. All right, (laughs) don't just show up with a live sheep and be like, I got an idea. Don't do that. All right, (laughs) make sure it gets coordinated. Okay, but. I know that that was their offerings. They brought these offerings to the Lord. Today, our offerings help support the church and the ministry of the church. And when we bring those offerings in, it's a way for us to rejoice in who God is. And that's something that's good for us to remember too, is that our offering is just, oh yeah, I got a gift. God's going to get me. It's not how God functions. God wants to bless you. And that's how he blesses you. God wanted to bless Israel. And so he said, what? If you you focus on me, you give offerings to me, if you make everything about me, guess what? I'm going to bless you. Just like this green lush mountain behind you. You see that? I'm going to come over this side. And when you don't do that, bad things are going to happen. And these are the bad things that are going to happen. Just like this rocky hill mountain that's right behind you. God was it. God uses visuals too. I love that. When I was reading this story, I was like, wow, it's so cool how God decided to use visuals. You know why? Because God knew what it was going to take to get through to Israel. What did they do? They almost missed the whole thing, didn't they? They were so busy trying to fight a battle in the name of God, they forgot to do what God commanded them to do. God said, I just want you to get back to where I told you to be, right here between these two mountains, worshiping me glorifying me and praising me for the blessings that I've given you. Man, Israel, they had experienced some blessings. They already had two tribes, two and a half tribes, already on the other side of the river that that took their land and said, well, we're happy right where we're at. Now they're walking in and their first battle, all they had to do was walk, walk and be quiet. 
until the last day when they what? Raised a shout. Then they shouted and the walls fell. That was like God was saying, you see what happens when you're with me? Because to God, this instance right here was like already a done deal. What Moses had commanded them to do in Deuteronomy 26 was already a done deal. God's like, right here, this is what it's about. See what I'm doing? I'm already showing you. And immediately they forgot. They got so excited about what was going on around them that they went running off saying, oh, this is great. Let's do more. No, always make it about God. Always make it about God. You see something good happen in your life. Stop for a minute and talk to God about it. Say, God, I just want to tell you thank you. And I don't, don't, don't be, uh, I know this is a personal thing for me. Don't just be one of those, whoo, thank God. People say that all the time. No, actually stop and say, dear Lord, Amen. I want to tell you thank you. Make it personal between you and God. I don't care how big or how small it is. Make it personal between you and God. Because God wants you to see his blessings. God wants you to see his blessings. Just like when something goes wrong, then you're like, okay, God, I understand. I was going in the wrong direction and I had to correct that in my life. Thank you for correcting me. God also wants you to see his correction too, doesn't he? We don't just say, whoo, man, that was, that was kind of tough. Huh? Hope that never happens again. We'll follow God and hopefully it won't. Right? If we follow God, it most likely won't. As long as God is our focus and we're serving him. But when we do that, we learn to rejoice in what God has done for us. You say, I don't have anything to give God glory in. Look harder. Look harder. We have to. Because God, I mean, if you woke up with a pulse this morning, God gave you another day on this earth to be a testimony to him. What do we have on this morning? Our light's on again. We know that lighthouse comes on when somebody comes to the saving knowledge of God. You tell me you ain't got nothing to glory in God about? Well, I don't know who the person was. Does it matter? Do we, we got to line them up here and step them up and then make sure, you know, we're going we're gonna to interrogate them and make sure their salvation stuck. Because if we don't know, then we're not satisfied. No, it's not. That's between them and God, isn't it? But folks, when that happens, that, that light doesn't go on willy-nilly. That light goes on when someone comes to know Jesus Christ. And you know what? There's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents, right? And anything else, the angels, man, they love it. That's the way we need to be too. You know what? I got something to glory in. I got to see that lighthouse on. That means I know someone was saved. And if you say, well, that lighthouse isn't on nearly enough, there's a way to fix it. Amen. We all get a little bit more involved in it, right? Yeah. And if you get involved in it, and you know what? I'll tell you the same thing. Because I had someone, I, I was talking to someone, they, they were telling me about that the other day, and I was like, I should have that person flip the switch on Sunday morning. Man, if you talk to, wind up talking to somebody and they get saved, don't be afraid to come up to me and say, I'm, do I get to flip the switch this morning? Because this is what happened this week. Yes, praise the Lord. Let's do that. Let's get a little bit more excited about what God is doing. Amen? Yeah. Get back to it. He said, Israel, rejoice in who God is. So that's God. And then one more thing here. We need to resolve to be dedicated. Resolve to be dedicated to what God has commanded as well. In verse 34 and verse 35 of Joshua chapter 8. Verse 34 and 35, it says, and afterward, this is talking about Joshua now, and afterward he read most of the words that Moses had commanded. Oh, that's not what it says, does it? It says, and afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings according to all that is written in the book of the law. Remember, half of Israel was on one side, half of Israel was on the other side facing these two mountains, and right in the middle was the altar, right in the middle was what, what else? The Ark of the Covenant of God. They had made their sacrifices, they had rejoiced, they glorified in God, and now Joshua said, I'm reading everything because I want you guys to know everything. I don't want us to forget this again. So he read everything, all of that. Verse 35, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers that were conversant among them. You know what that means? The people that understood, oh, they got it all. That's what that says. But who else did they involve in it? Women, children, everybody. He was like, this is not just for you fighting age men between the ages of 18 and 30. 
This is for everybody. Because if we're not all in this together, we're not all doing what God wants us to do. And Joshua's like, I'm not making the same mistake again. We're doing this and we're going all the way to it. He was dedicated to making sure that they did it exactly the way they were commanded to do it back in Deuteronomy 27. And we see that in Deuteronomy 27, verses 8 through 10. And this is what Moses says. Thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. I love that. Very plainly. You know what that means? Find somebody who writes clean. That means I wouldn't have been allowed to do it. All right? Write it down so everybody can see it. And Moses and the priests and the Levites spake unto all Israel, saying, Take heed and hearken, O Israel. This day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. You know what happens when someone gets saved? That day they become the person of the Lord God. They are now God's people because they are saved. They are adopted by our Heavenly Father. They receive that salvation. And this is what he's saying. This day, remember, and it, this wasn't some magical moment. They were saying, renew this covenant, come back to this, and I want you to resolve to be dedicated to what is happening. You are the people of God. Verse 10, thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Then later on this verse, and you can read it later on if you want to, in Deuteronomy 27, he goes through blessings and cursings. The next, actually, next two chapters, 27, 28, he goes through all that. You know what Joshua did? Oh, we're not stopping until we do the whole thing. We're doing everything because we can ill afford to make the mistake that we made at AI. He says, we need to get back to where we're supposed to be. You know, those blessings and those cursings, they were pretty basic things. There, it wasn't like, you know, hey, when you fight battles, make sure you wear your swords on your left side, tied with a square knot around your belt, and your shoes are, 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 are tied this way, you know, your sandals are all tied. There wasn't like difficult instructions for them to follow. They were basic. Glorify God. Focus on God. Be obedient to God. And there was literally one instruction they were given in Jericho. Don't take the cursed thing. One instruction. But because they weren't dedicated in that moment, they failed, didn't they? You say, well, you know, one person. I, you can say all kinds of things about that one person. But you know what? It's Israel as a whole. Because not only did Achan take... Then they go to Ai and they're like, it's in our strength. 3,000 guys are enough. If that was a, Achan was a reflection of the hearts of Israel. That's what it was. They had lost sight of where they needed to be. They, didn't, they weren't focusing on the basics of what it means. Christian, don't make your Christianity complex. Focus on the basics. Amen. And do them well. When it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, everything you got, all your spirit, right? Do it well. Wake up every day and say, God, I love you. With everything that I have in me, I love you. And when you find yourself falling away from that, stop and say, oh, no, no. God, I love you with all that I have in me. And you'll learn to do it well. And then you'll wake up in the morning and the first thing that you think about is what? God, I love you. And by the way, you're like, well, that's hard. Well, the Bible tells us this. We love him because he first loved us. We can learn to do it well because our heavenly father does it oh so well. He does it better than we ever will. Right? We just need to get good at the basics. Israel experienced victory when they got back to where God wanted them to be. This passage here in Deuteronomy, before ever they crossed the river, before ever they set foot in the land, Moses said, this is what you need to do. So Joshua said, you know what we're doing before we ever fight another battle? This is what we're doing. Let's bring it in. Let's get everybody where they're supposed to be. Let's get our focus back. Let's worship God. Let's get our focus back where it needs to be. And let's renew our commitment to God. So that when we walk away from this place, because Israel wasn't going to stay there between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. 
They were going to go on and fight more battles. There's a, a whole lot more battles to fight. You go looking through Joshua and you're like, wow, there's a lot that we don't have stories about. Do you realize they fought so many battles they just decided to list them later on? That's true. They just started listing the battles that they won. But those battles would not have been victories had they not had this moment. Find the moment where you get back to the basics and you say, this is what worshiping God is all about. This is what walking with God is all about. Come back to the basics. God, I love you, and I want to worship you in every aspect of my life so that I can glorify you. Bow your heads with me this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed.